Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord. Well, is everybody ready this morning? Yes. Got your listening ears on? Praise God. We got a good word for you. Praise God. A little girl finally got to attend a wedding for the first time. While in the church, the girl asked her mother, Why is the bride dressed in white? The mother replied to the girl, Because white is the color of happiness, and it's the happiest day of her life today. After a little bit, the girl pondering, she looks at her mother and says, Then why is the groom wearing black? <laughs> it's a fair question. You want one more? These are all mine. Just joking. After having children, Adam and Eve started getting a lot of questions from their kids about why they no longer lived in Eden. Adam had a simple answer for this. Your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> I like that one. He that finds a wife finds a good thing. That's right. I have to add that. You don't have to, you get to. I, that is right. I get to. Is there anything else you want to add? That I want to add? We're good. <laughs> Amen. Well, glory to God. I we'll invite you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 43. Hey, listen, you got to get a little more lively than that this morning. Are you with me this morning? Yes. We got some things that'll set you free this morning. Amen. The Word always does that. Amen. We've been talking about being not guilty on the basis of the Word. We're going to pick up sort of where we left off last time. We'll kind of hit our key scriptures and then carry on. How many of you have ever, uh, ever had those moments when you had to plead your innocence for something? Anybody? You know, at some point in your life, you know, you end up having to say, I didn't do it. Say boldly, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I'm not guilty. I'm not right? See, it doesn't matter if, if, you know, maybe you had those moments. How many of you have siblings? Then you've had those moments when you had to say, I didn't do it. You had to plead your innocence. Right? How many of you went to school? Then you had those moments where you had to plead your innocence. Now, I didn't do that. I was a good model student and A student, and I was perfect all my years of school. So I... Uh, I remember, I remember my uh, middle school years, I was good friends with the, a uh, bunch of us were actually, we were good friends with the middle school principal because we were all uh, good friends with his son. And so, uh, so in all honesty, I, I never, you know, hardly ever got in trouble at school in particular because I knew uh, I had a father waiting for me at home. <laughs> and so, so uh, but I remember one time for middle school, I got a call over the, the intercom system and uh, it says, uh, says, John Mathis, Principal Solomon needs to see you in his office. And I was looking around and I thought, dear God, what did I do? I honestly can't think of anything that I did. And I mean, it was, his secretary sounded sincere. This was, this, you know, he meant business. And so I walked down there and, and uh, she says, take a seat. And so I took a seat and kind of waited my time. And I think they purposely made me sit there for a while. And, but, uh, but I sat there for a while. And then the moment came and she said, he'll see you now. And I'll walk in. And he said, shut the door behind you. And I was like, man, this is serious. And so I shut the door. He's a big old man. You know, he was 6'4", he was 6'5", six, 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 and, and uh, big guy. And so, so he says, shut the door behind you. And then he just started chuckling like Santa Claus, just started laughing. And, and uh, he says, I understand it's your birthday. And I said, it is. And he goes, well, come here. And I thought he was going to give me a gift. He grabbed me, turned me around, grabbed that paddle off his desk and hit me with it. And uh, he was just chuckling the whole time. And so we, uh, after the sting wore off, we had, a, uh, we had a good time with that. That was the only time I ever got in trouble, ever. Believe that? <laughs> well, praise God. Maybe you've been one of those. You've actually been in court before. You had to pre plead not guilty. Well, this morning, you know, we, we, uh, we can honestly plead not guilty on the basis of the word. You know, it doesn't matter what your past is like. In Isaiah 43, verse 25, it says, I am he that blots out your transgressions. 
Well, what does that mean? It's gone. If it's blotted out, it's gone. I am he that blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us plead together. Declare thou that you may be justified. Notice it says, declare thou that you may be justified. See, you have a part to play in this innocence, in this pleading of not guilty. What's your part? It says, you plead not guilty. You declare not guilty. See, it's one thing to know what the Word says, and we find out a lot in what the Bible says to us, but you have to take God's Word and put it in your mouth for it to become effective. Amen. So in the Word, he says, let us plead together. He says, but you declare that you may be justified. Not guilty. Not guilty. I like in the voice translation, it says, I am he who wipes the slate clean and erases your wrongdoing. Glory to God. Isaiah 118, the Lord starting off by saying, Come now, let us reason together. See, a minute ago we said plead together. He says, Let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Thank God. Thank God. And then our other key scripture, 1 John 2, 1 says, If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Glory to God. Amen. And, and one of the things that we've said every single time we've got up is, is, is even if you miss it, see, we've all missed it. We just established that, right? Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Isn't that right? For all have sinned. But listen, if you miss it, there's always a way back. If you make a mess of things, we can always get it cleaned up. Praise God. You know, this, this, this last week we had the kids with us and, and you know, there was, there was a dirty diaper or two. There was a bathroom moment or two. But you know something, at no point in time did I ever look at them and say, you know what, you just made a mess of things. You're out. I mean, at the end of every day, there was toys strung from one end of the house to the other. My dad was, was joking with me and he said, uh, he said, I bet you appreciate Christina a little bit more having to take care of them three kids and so, uh, I mean, at the end of every day, there was toys strung from, from top to bottom all around the house. And so, I mean, we're still finding little, little die-cast metal cars around the house and stuff, you know. Well, you know, we didn't look at them at the end of the day and say, you made a mess of things, get out. You're not welcome here no more. Aren't you so glad he didn't do that with us? Aren't you so glad that the Lord doesn't look at us and say, you sure made a mess of things, you're out. That was your only chance. No, we serve a God of a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance and you just go on and on and on. His mercies are forever, aren't they? Amen. Glory to God. And then we also saw, saw in Romans 8, 1, notice the heart of the Father here. He says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit. Thank God for that. Well, it, it, condemnation, it, it literally means utter rejection. God never looks at us and just says, I can't even stand to look at you and turns around. You know, he never does that. Condemnation means unfit, unlivable. You know, if you think of, of a building being condemned, it, it means it's unfit, it's unlivable. Nobody can, can inhabit this building again. Well, so the Bible says there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Now watch this. In 1 John 3, 21, it says, If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence towards God. Well, that's the key. See, if, if nobody is there to condemn you, if you're not condemning yourself, then all of a sudden what happens is you have, you have a, a heart that condemns us not, then you have confidence towards God. 1 John 5.14 says this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that He hears us, then we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. But you know something, if there's a sense of guilt, uh, it'll keep you from asking for anything with confidence. No, you know, if, if you have guilt in your life, if there's anything holding you back, you're not going to go before God with confidence to ask anything. We know that in, in dealing with, with, you know, when we were kids, dealing with our kids. You know, if there's ever any guilt or shame that they've done anything wrong, they're not going to come ask you for anything. 
But on the contrary, you know, when our kids come to our house, when, when our grandkids come to our house, you know, Matthew, we had the whole family over yesterday. My kids, grandkids, you know, they don't even have to ask. They can go into the cupboard and get anything they want. If it's mine, it's theirs. Right? They don't have to ask because they know I want them to have it. If, if, there's, if there's anything in the refrigerator that they want, they can have it. I don't care. Right? Well, and, and if it runs out, we'll go get more. And I don't care how many times a day we have to go get it. We'll go get more. We'll go get another one. They must have 150 of those, 200 of those little Hot Wheels cars. And you know what? If we go to the store and they want another one, Papa's going to buy them one. Because they need 200 and one. Never enough. Well, that's the way that, that God treats us. And, and you know, but, but here, here's the thing. Again, if there's a sense of guilt and shame that I did something wrong, then they're not going to come with confidence to say, can I have? You're going to do the same thing. You're not going to go before God and, and request anything, ask anything, if there's a sense of guilt or shame. So confidence sets you up for answered prayers and a fulfilled life. Think about that. In Psalm 32, 1 and Psalm 85, 2, it says, Your sin is covered and your iniquity is forgiven. Hebrews 10, 17 says, And their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. So if you're forgiven, then it's important that you respond in kind. If you're forgiven and there's no guilt, then you have to respond in kind. So let's go to uh, John chapter 8. We read this story last time. We're just going to see a different side of things today. John chapter 8, starting with verse number 1. John chapter 8. Actually, let's start with verse number 3. It says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, in the very act, taken in adultery, when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses in the law... How many of you know that, that the law was harsh? The law was harsh. You, you know, an act like this was actually punishable by death. So the law focused on the punishment. And so now most, they said, Moses in the law commands us that such should be stoned, but what do you say? And this they said, tempting him that they might have a way to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not, and when they continued asking, he lifted himself up, and he said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him cast the stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. Jesus was left standing alone with the woman standing in the midst. Now watch this, this is so important. When Jesus had lifted himself up, he saw none but the woman, and he said unto her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no man condemned you? And she said, No man, Lord. And he said, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. You know, you have a choice. You know, this woman had a choice. She could either walk in that forgiveness or she could keep going back to that point of accusation. You know, we do that a lot, you know, whenever we, we feel like we've, we've done the unpardonable sin. We've sinned the unpardonable sin. How could God ever use me? How could, how could God ever forgive me? We've all experienced that. That guilt and shame that comes, especially with somebody who has a pure heart before God. You remember we talked about David last time we were together, and we talked about how the Bible mentions that, that David was a man after God's own heart. A number of times we saw that. But the thing about David was he was sincere. He sincerely sought repentance for the things that he had done wrong. We named a number of those. It wasn't just thing, the thing with Bathsheba that he did. I mean, there was a number of things, a number of places that David missed it. But the Bible says, a number of times, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. We even see him pinning the words in the book of Psalms. He says, I sought after the Lord with all my heart, or I followed hard after God. David found a place of repentance. And because he found that place of repentance, what happens is, is just like this woman with adultery, you have a choice. You can keep going back to the point of accusation or you can walk free. So notice he tells her, he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. What was he saying? 
Let's not come back to this moment. Let's not come back here. So you're thinking your life that you've done, that maybe you've, you just seem to have a hard time getting over. The Lord's looking at you saying, let's not come back here. Let's not come back here. Because truly to repent means to, to make a 180 degree turn and to go the other way. That's what true repentance is all about. So the devil will continually remind you that you're paying for the wrongdoing of your past. And so what you have to do is shut him down immediately. The first time that that thought comes to your mind, you shut him down. Because there's two equally condemning lies of the devil, and that's number one, that just once won't hurt. Think about that. You know, sometimes you think, well, if I, if I do this just this once, it'll be all right. Well, it's a lie of the devil. But then number two is now that you've missed it, God can no longer use you. And that's a lie of the devil also. Come on now. See, we're talking about walking free from condemnation. You're there in John chapter 8. Turn back to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Look at verse number 2. Again, we read these last time. I just want you to see something. Now there is at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. And for an angel went down at a certain season into the pool, troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in, was made whole of whatever disease he had. And a certain man was there, which had an infirmity thirty-eight years. And when Jesus saw him lie, he knew that he had been there a long time in that case. And he said unto him, Will you be made whole? And the impotent man answered and said, Sir, I have no man, for when the water is troubled, to put me into the water, into the pool. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. And Jesus said unto him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. Now notice verse 14. This is, this is something I want you to see here. Verse 14, it says, And afterwards, because Jesus excused himself, and so it says, Afterwards, Jesus finds him in the temple. And says unto him, Behold, you are made whole. See, he's talking to the man that was just healed. He says, Behold. Well, behold means look at yourself. He's saying, Look, look at yourself. Look at your situation. He says, Behold, you are made whole. Sin no more. Now watch this. Lest a worse thing come on you. It's interesting, isn't it? So, so he tells the woman caught in adultery, he tells this man that's healed here, he tells both of them what? Go and sin no more. He says, go and sin no more. Well, think about that. Go and sin no more. But notice in this one, Jesus said, lest the worst thing come upon you. Lest the worst thing come upon you. Listen, that's important wording there. Look over at Romans chapter 5. All of this will tie together here. True repentance means you don't keep coming back. Right? It means you don't keep coming back. Romans chapter 5 verse 20. And we'll read into chapter 6 a little bit. It says, Moreover the law entered, Romans 5 20, Moreover the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Thank God. That as sin reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Christ Jesus our Lord. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? So what's being said here is, is yes, there's grace, yes, there's forgiveness, but that's not a license to sin. That's what he was telling the woman that was caught in adultery. He said, he said, go and sin no more. He said, I'm not giving you a license to sin. There's not continual forgiveness for you to keep coming back here. He said, but go and sin no more. How many of you think if she missed it again, that forgiveness would be there? Sure it was. I'm convinced that the Lord Jesus Christ would walk you down to the very gate of hell with his hand extended to you saying, come back. I forgive you. There's a way out. There's always a way out. There's all, it doesn't matter how deep you've gone, how bad you've done it, how many times you've done it. There's always a way out. 
He made it so easy for us. He paid the price so that you wouldn't have to. He made it easy. And that, the way he made it easy is when he said, just repent. If you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We saw that again. We saw that with David. You know, here, here's Nathan coming to David and he says, you are that man. And the Bible says that David repented. So here we find David. You know, David found a place of repentance. David was somebody that, because he found that place of repentance, there, there, was, uh, there, there was forgiveness. We saw this with Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah was sick unto death. And the Bible says that, that uh, the man of God came to him and he said, you're going to die. And then it says that he turned his face to the wall. He had a get, get real with God moment. Sometimes that's what it takes. Sometimes you have to be, be in that moment. You have to get real with God and you have to say, you know what, I'm, Father, I'm sincerely apologetic. Forgive me. There's always a place of repentance. Well, the Bible says he turned his face to the wall and before the man of God uh, got out of the temple, it says before he, he even left the courts, he said the Lord told him to turn around and go back and tell him I'm adding 15 years to your life. Somebody say sincere. See, it's all about being sincere. Amen. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Well, how many of you know every single morning when you get up, you can thank God, I'm a new creature. Well, the book of Lamentations tells us that his mercies are new every morning. So every morning, no matter what you did yesterday, thank God you can get up and say, Today's a new day. Glory to God, I'm a new creature. Amen. I'm a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. In the voice translation, it says, the old life is gone. The new life has begun. In the passion translation, it says, everything is fresh and it is new. Glory to God. And so according to the word, we see that every believer has the life of God abiding in him or her. But you have to allow that new life in Christ to dominate you. It has to be the thing that has your focus and your attention. Because if it doesn't, listen, the devil's just going to keep bringing things to you. He's going to be, keep bringing it up to you. He's gonna, it's, it's just going to be in your mind. And he, you know, one, he's persistent. He's not going to quit. So it has to dominate you. Think about this. I, I was reminded of this story because I, I read through uh, Brother Hagen's uh, health food every day. But this story came up. And uh, it fit really well here. So I'm gonna, just give me a moment. I want to read this to you. So if you have this devotional, this is, you've read this also. But it applies here. It says, years ago I was ministering at a youth camp in the Sierra Mountains near Sonora, California. And I received an emergency telephone call. The voice on the other end said, Brother Hagen, do you remember Gary? Well, I did. The man was talking about his oldest boy who was nine at the time. Well, he said, we had a sore, he said he had a sore throat and we prayed about it, but it got worse. We carried him to the doctor. The doctor said that the infection had gone to his kidneys. Now his kidneys have stopped functioning. The doctor said that he would be dead in a matter of minutes. So he's in intensive care and we want you to agree with us. We believe that Gary will live and not die. I said, well, I believe with you that he will live and he will not die. I was at this youth camp for several weeks, and before I left, I received a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorded in the mail. On it, the man said to me, Brother Hagan, they would only let me into the intensive care unit for five minutes a day, but I would say to Gary, you'll live, you'll lie there and say, himself took my infirmities and bear my sicknesses, I'll live and not die. Well, that little nine-year-old fellow said over and over and over again for two days and two nights, suddenly he was all right. So we just brought Gary home and he wants to say something to you. Then I heard, remember this is on this reel to reel tape. And then I heard Gary say, Brother Hagan, I want to thank you for bringing the truth to me. Dad has already told you, but I must have said those words over and over 10,000 times each night. The doctors couldn't understand how that little boy lived, but he did. God's word works. But now think about this. This is the rest of the story. When Gary was... 15, see the first part of that story, he was 9 when this happened. So when Gary was 15 or 16 years old, he left home. He got away from God, became involved in the hippie movement, and he actually denounced God. And at that time, the kidney trouble that he was healed of at 9 years old came back on him. I went to Dallas to preach, and Gary came to my meeting, 
He wasn't right with God, and I knew he wasn't. And, he, and I knew he wasn't. He tried to fake it, but he didn't fool me a bit. He was 17 or 18 years at the time. And I said to him, no, I'm not going to pray for you. You're not going to get healed under the present conditions because you're just faking it. Well, there's a difference between being sincere and faking it. There's a lot of people that feel like they can fake their way through God. He says, you haven't made things right with God, and he admitted I was right. He said, you've told me the truth about it, and I haven't. There are a lot of things in me that, I sh that should not be in me. I'm not right with God, and I know I'm not right with God, but I don't want to die. The doctors say I'm going to die. They say I haven't got much longer to live. I say, well, you have to get lined up with God. But he says this, he says, you know, Gary refused to do that until he got right down to doors to death's door, and it cost him his life. I'm glad he got back in fellowship with God during the last few minutes of his life. He died praising God, but if he had done that six months ahead of time, he would have been healed. So I'm reading both those stories to read this end part here. It's important to walk with God. God doesn't put on any half price sales. It's all or nothing with God. Make Jesus your Lord. Now watch this. Let him dominate your life. Purpose to walk with him. I like that phrase. God doesn't put on any half price sales. Man, I'm a bargain shopper. I love a good bargain. I love to shop. I, I'm probably, probably one of the only guys in the room that, that, that has more clothes than his wife. I can out shop my wife. She don't even like to go to the grocery store. I mean, she's not a shopper. But I love to shop. I look, I man, I, I have a, an Amazon account, and, and, and there's just something about getting home at the end of the day, and there's a box waiting. It's like, it's like your birthday all over. <laughs> it doesn't matter that I bought it. It's, you know, I always, it, man, I don't care what it is. I love getting gifts at, at home to myself. It's, it's, a good thing, it's a good thing I grow up in a different era that, that I wasn't one of these that, you know, the home shopping network, it might be a popular thing still, I don't know, but, but uh, QVC and all that, man, if I would have had money back in those days, whew. Well, you understand something. When he says there are no half price sales with God, what he's saying is it's all or nothing. There are no bargain shopping with him. There are no half price sales. There's no markdown aisles. It's all or nothing. The kids and, and Sheila got me a uh, one of those Yeti. They call them a hop, hopper. Have you see these hoppers? It looks like a big uh, big tote bag, and so uh, so it's got all these loops on it, you know, and it's got three or four ways to carry it. And and uh, you know, I'm, I was hoping to get on the back of. Pastor Mark and Miss Margaret Strike can go on vacation with them just so I could take my Yeti cooler, you know, and <laughs> use this thing for the beach. But uh, I don't know why I'm telling you that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm a shopper. I like to give gifts to myself. I like to receive gifts. But when it comes to the things of God, again, there are no half price sales. It's all or nothing with God. Listen, we have a responsibility in this. Ephesians chapter 4 and Colossians chapter 2 both says, put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. See, the, the implied is you put it on. You put on the new man. You have a responsibility. We all have to let the things of God dominate us. Revelation 21, 5 says, behold, I make all things new. Romans 6, 4 says, We are buried with him in baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice the way he says that. He says, We're buried with him in baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. Again, he's putting it back on us. This has happened. This is available to you. But he says, you have to walk in it. You have to do it. You have to walk it out. He says, I can't do it for you. You do it. You walk in newness of life. Romans 5, 8 says, but God commends, or, or another way of saying, he demonstrates. God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
Why is, it, why is all this so important? Because your old life has an expiration date on it. Your old life has a shelf life. You, you ever seen something uh, on your shelf and you realize it was out of date three years ago? You know, we don't, if I could show you a picture of my refrigerator, we don't have much, we, we do now, just because we had so much food last night at the house, but... Uh, you know, when we went on vacation, I took a picture and sent it to my son, Matthew, because I was telling him, I said, thank God we're going on vacation because we need food. You know, we, we just don't, you know, we, with both of us working, it's easier for us to just go get a bite to eat than it is to sit and make a big meal. And so we don't keep stuff. And, and so the refrigerator, I think, had a couple cans of LaCroix water or AHA water or something like that and, and maybe an, a thing of sour cream, which was expired, by the way. And... Uh, a little tub of, of uh, butter. And I think that's all that was in there. I mean, there wasn't anything in that refrigerator at all. But what was in there was expired. Well, we've all done that. We've all gone through our cupboard, our cabinets or whatever, and, and, and seen things that are expired. You know, well, our old life has an expiration date. Amen. And, and so understand this, because it has an expiration date, what happens is, is living a lifestyle of sin actually reduces that expiration date, shortens it. You know, it's interesting in talking to my brother-in-law, Doug. You know, he, he works for the Bradley County Sheriff's Department. He, he tells us all the time the people that he comes in contact with, and it's unfortunate, but people that live a lifestyle of sin, he said it affects them mentally and physically. And he said it's really a shame, but, but especially, of course, you know this, but especially the ones that are dealing with drugs and alcohol and things like that, man, it affects them drastically. He said you can come up to somebody that's 20-something years old and they look like they're in their 50s. Well, living a lifestyle of sin costs you, and it actually shortens your time on this earth. We know that. Ephesians chapter 6 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, for it's the first commandment with promise. That you, and it goes on to say that you may live a long time on the earth. That it may be well with you. That you may live a long time on the earth. Whenever you do what mama says, it benefits you. Right? Whenever you do what daddy says, it benefits you. You don't die early. You ever heard me tell the story about the, the, the uh, what you call those big wheels? I tell it in, in school occasionally, but, but when I was a kid, you know, I don't even know if they still have them, but they had these things that had a great big old wheel on the front and had two wheels on the back, so you pedaled on the, the front wheel. And so I remember my parents got me this big wheel for birthday, Christmas, something like that, and I had this big wheel. And so, man, I love that thing. And, uh, but this particular place in Austin that we lived, you know, our house had a, a steep drive that went down into a main road. And, you know, a main road like out here. It wasn't like a, a, a subdivision. I mean, it was a main road. And they said, now here's the rule with this three, this big wheel. You can ride this big wheel up and down. You can do as much as you want, but you cannot go down the hill of this driveway. Well, the only thing I heard was you can go down this driveway as fast as you want to go. And so I was determined to go down that driveway. And so I got on this big wheel, and I got it all the way to the top of the driveway, and I pedaled as fast as I could, and I went down that driveway, and smack, got hit by a car. Yeah, I'm still here. I made it. Do you know not a broken bone? I got up, cried a little bit, brushed myself off, went to the side of the road, and no doubt my parents told me, now listen, fool, there's a reason why we said don't get up on top of that driveway. Now, my mama didn't call me a fool. She probably hugged me, kissed me, was glad that I'm alive. My dad probably looked at me and said, you fool. That's what dads do, you know. Mama's hug on them. Dad's call him a fool. No, I'm sure he didn't. My daddy loves me. Y'all going to loosen up here? Telling on me here. Because I was wrong. Sheila pointed that out. I was wrong. There was forgiveness. I found a place of repentance. But it couldn't have been that way. It could not have been that way. You ever done something in your life and, and you knew without a doubt that when you were in the midst of it, you fool. You knew you shouldn't be there. You know you shouldn't be doing this. You know this shouldn't be a part of what you're all about. Psalm 55, 23 says, Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out 
half their days. There are decisions that we make in this life that can shorten our lives. Ecclesiastes 7.17 says, Be not overly wicked, neither be foolish. See, I'm just telling you what the Word says. Don't be a fool. Why should you die before your time? That's what the Bible says. How about a few more? 1 John 5.18, We know that whosoever is born of God sins not, but he that is begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. Whenever you keep yourself, whenever you act according to the word of God, the Bible says that the wicked one can't touch you. Proverbs 19.23 says, The fear of the Lord tends to life, and he that has it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. That's the word of God. The Message Bible says, you know where it says he shall abide satisfied? It says he'll have a full life with no nasty surprises. I like that. Glory to God. 2 Peter 3.14 says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, that is the coming of the Lord, if you look, look at it in context, be diligent that you may be found of him in peace without spot and blameless. Notice it doesn't say perfect. We're not looking for perfection. We all miss it. But there's something about keeping yourself and remaining without spot and blameless. Philippians 2.15 says that you may be blameless and harmless. That is just another way of saying innocent. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Glory to God. So, so just a number of ways of saying, listen, if you do what the Word says, your life is going to be extended, but if you don't, it's going to be shortened. Hezekiah's life was getting ready to be shortened, but he found a place of repentance. Are you following me? Why is this so important? Because the Word of God has declared us not guilty, but you have a responsibility, you have a part to play in that. Proverbs chapter 4. Just a few more passages here. Proverbs chapter 4, verse number 10 says, Hear my son and receive my sayings that the, that the years of your life shall be many. I have taught you in the ways of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you go, your steps shall not be straightened uh, or just, a, just another way of, of talking about being hindered. And when you run, you shall not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her for she is your life. She is your life. Enter not into the path of the wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away. In other words, don't go around it. Did you get that? Enter not into the path of wicked. Go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it. Don't pass by it. Turn from it. Pass away. You know, last week we were on the road and, and uh, man, it's like traffic was backed up for miles and miles. And we were trying to figure out, I mean, it was in the middle of the day. There's no reason for this traffic to be here. What in the world's going on? And then when you get up to it, you realize what's happened is off the interstate, off to the side, somebody had a wreck, and so everybody was slowing down to see it. Was passing by it, seeing what's going on, being nosy. And, and then by the time we got past it, then the traffic just went on. Well, I think that's what happens sometimes with us. Notice it says, talk about the wicked, it says avoid it, don't even pass by it. Go the other way. Come on now. For they sleep not except they have done mischief. Their sleep is taken away unless they come to some fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness, drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light and shines more and more unto the perfect day. One translation says it shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness and they know not at what they stumble. But notice... My son, attend to my words, incline your ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from your eyes. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So we have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to turn from darkness, but turn to the word. Turn to the light. Are you with me? 
We read earlier Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The gift of God is eternal life. 1 Timothy 4.8 says, Godliness is profitable, having the promise of the life which now is, and that which is to come. Here's the good news for you today. Your life now as a believer does not have an expiration date. I said your life now as a believer does not have an expiration date. The new and improved you will live forever. That ought to excite you. Amen. Everybody stand to your feet. Glory to God. I encourage you, replace yesterday's past with scriptural promises about tomorrow. You know, sometimes we just need to, to have a new outlook on life. I, I like so much that first song that they were talking about and singing. You know, this is my testimony from death to life. This is my testimony. You know, when you, when you go before court, you have, to, you have to stand up and you have to give your testimony. This is what I say. Well, here's our testimony. We went from death, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. We went from death to life. Thank God for that. So you no longer have to pay the penalty for the sins that you committed because Jesus already paid the price. Well, what an insult would that be to him if you said, well, I'm just not worthy. I'm just not worthy. You don't know what I did. You don't understand what I did. Well, listen, we already gave David as an example. Right, we did that last time we were together. David, David did a number of things, but David, you know, whenever Nathan pointed out to David, he said, you are that man. David said, Lord, forgive me. With a sincere heart, David found a place of repentance. Hezekiah, again, turned his face to the wall. Hezekiah found a place of repentance. Maybe this morning you need to find that place of repentance. Maybe, maybe what you did was small. Maybe what you did was big. You know what? In the eyes of God, it doesn't matter. Find a place of repentance this morning. Find somewhere where you can say, Lord, forgive me. Just right where you stand. This is between you and God. Lord, forgive me. There's something that I've done in my life. Whatever it is, there's something I've done in my life that I need to ask you forgiveness for. Maybe it's the way that you talk to your wife this morning or maybe the way you talk to your husband or your kids. Maybe it's something that you've done unethically on the job. Lord, forgive me. Whatever it is, Find a place of repentance. Find a place of repentance so that you can boldly declare, I'm not guilty this morning. His mercies are new every morning. So I encourage you, don't leave this place like you came in. If there's something eating at you, deal with it. Don't give the devil a moment. Find a place of repentance. Lord, forgive me. If there's anything in my life that I've done that would keep me from following hard after you, I repent. I repent. Maybe you're in the sound of my voice this morning in the auditorium, maybe watching online, and you say, I don't know what that means. I've never asked Jesus to be Lord of my life. I've never asked anybody to forgive me for anything. This morning, if you find that place of repentance, I guarantee you, He's ready to receive you with open arms. And all it takes is to say, Father, forgive me. Right then, in that moment, right then, you turned your life from death to eternal life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Heaven is real. Hell is real. I said heaven is real and hell is real. I'll say it again. Heaven is real and hell is real. You have a choice this morning. He said in the word, I've set before you life and death. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life. Choose life every time. Run to God. Don't run from Him. Oh, glory to God. I thank you, Father, that you're faithful to your word. 
that you honor your word and you do for us exactly what you said you would do so that we can be, walk before you bold without condemnation or guilt so that in turn where there is no condemnation we can come before you with boldness and confidence this is the confidence that we have in you that if we ask anything according to your will and we know that you hear us we know that we have the desires and the petitions that we desire of you oh glory to God that's confidence that's boldness that's all because of Jesus thank God Thank God. Thank God. We are delivered this morning. We are free this morning. We are not guilty this morning. Aren't you so glad? I said, aren't you so glad? Sure beats the alternative. I said, it sure beats the alternative. Paying the price for your penalties. Anybody ever had to pay the price for your penalties? Anybody ever had to pay for a ticket for speed? Huh? Thank God, in the eyes of God, you're not guilty. So quit paying the price. Quit thinking that I'm sick because of something I've done. There's forgiveness and there's healing. I said there's forgiveness and there's healing. There's forgiveness and there's healing. I, I used to hear Brother Hagin say all the time that, that sometimes the Lord will heal you on credit, but then you have a responsibility to turn your life around to turn and act in kind. Notice he told the, the man at the pool of Bethesda, he said, go and sin no more. Say so that had something to do with his healing? Apparently so. Apparently so. Come on now, the decisions that we make affect us in the life that now is and that which is to come. What are you going to choose to do this morning? You'll heal your body this morning. Anybody in here this morning, you, you say, I'm dealing with symptoms in my body? Nobody has to lay hands on you. Maybe for you, it's just a matter of saying, Lord, forgive me and watch him work. Go and sin no more lest a worse thing come on you, he told him. Somebody this morning, I, I, I'm not asking you to come forward. That's between you and God. I don't know if you're in the auditorium or if you're watching this morning you're dealing with symptoms in your body and the Lord would say to you that issue that you've been dealing with that, that, that issue of unforgiveness that you've been dealing with if you'll deal with that you'll see a change in your body you'll see a healing take place and manifest itself something that you've struggled with for quite some time this morning you'll receive healing if you'll forgive you'll receive healing if you'll forgive Oh, glory to God. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God. Thank God for His mercy. His, the Lord is good and His mercy endures forever. 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 You can't exhaust His goodness and His mercy. Oh, glory to God. Just lift your hands and say, Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for forgiving us. Thank God for healing us. Find that place of repentance this morning and receive the healing that you need. Glory to God. He is faithful who promised. Glory to God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. He is faithful who promised. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Well, praise God. Did you get something this morning? I believe that you did also. We'll pick up. We've got some good things. We're going to have fun on Wednesday. i got some things to, to show you you're going to like. So you don't want to miss it. Amen. Again, keep Pastor Mark in your prayers. Miss Margaret in your prayers as they ride along. And uh, go relax. Get refreshed. Because that benefits us. Praise God. I said that benefits us. Amen. They come back refreshed and we're the beneficiary of it. Praise God. We love you. God bless you. You are dismissed. Amen.